It is a flea-infested, tick-infested, parasite-infected, special interest-infected, wet, smelly dog. I brought an abortion to show you today. Grandma isn't shovel-ready. This should not be passed by anyone unless they eat it. <laughs> Well, thanks to The Daily Show for that nice little compilation. But if you think democracy in the United States is screwy, it's at least better than someplace else, like Europe. Our next guest, Gary Young, a regular contributor to The Guardian, in fact, a New York correspondent and a Nation Institute fellow, as well as an author, wrote recently that compared to Europe, the US can at least make a pretense of democracy. So I guess our pretense is something, at least, Gary. What do you think? Well, there is that. I mean, in, uh, in Europe, um, you know, here you get to question um, uh, Geithner, you get to question Bernanke, you uh, get to have some influence on the economic process. In the EU, and uh, most specifically in the Eurozone, that just doesn't, that just doesn't happen. So right now, Greece uh, is basically being, its uh, economic policies are being dictated to it by uh, Germany, uh, and France and the rest of the EU. But when I look at the pictures and the scant bit of coverage we get in this country, I get the feeling that while there isn't a lot of unrest in the US, at least in Europe, there are pictures of people in the streets. That's, that's right. I mean, one of the reasons why um, uh, places like uh, Greece, uh, uh, Portugal and Spain are to some extent in so much uh, quote unquote trouble is because uh, there's been a lot of pushback to the rolling back of pensions, of the welfare state, of uh, unemployment insurance, and, and so on. And that uh, Greece has a very, very kind of vibrant um, uh, activist culture. Um, people have been out in the streets um, in, in a big way over the last couple of years. And they're definitely at this stage not taking this lying down. And the extent to which these things are possible, you know, people talk about politics being the art of the possible, which is usually a cop-out for not doing anything. But actually, in this case, the people creating new possibilities, saying, if you're going to do this, you're going to have a fight on your hands. Well, let's talk about it, because now with health care reform maybe being a thing of at least a temporary past in Congress, the focus is going to go back, I think, to economics, foreclosures, housing, you name it. Um, what has been the European experience in terms of government policy up until recently in Greece it wasn't about worrying about deficits so much as it was about growth and trying to keep people in jobs. What happened? Um, well, I mean, to a large extent, what happened is that Greece ran out of money. Um, I mean, it's not that there's not an economic problem there. And also, corruption is a huge, huge problem. Uh, I think uh, one in four uh, Greek workers is in some way employed by the state. Now, that needn't necessarily be a bad thing so long as they're gainfully employed and doing things that people uh, want. But uh, a lot of what's been going on in Greece, and the reason why the socialists were actually voted back in on a platform of um, uh, securing pensions and uh, bolstering the welfare state, was um, an anti-corruption platform. Now that they're in power, they're being told, and they're actually trying to follow those policies, to attack the, the people who voted for them yeah. and cut their living standards. And you blamed the Germans for this a little earlier. Well, the, the, I mean, it's really the, the edifice of the European uh, Union and the European Central Bank, which is one of the least democratic institutions that there is. Um, uh, nobody gets any say in who's appointed to the head of the bank. The minutes are secret. Um, uh, there's no uh, direct democracy at all. Um, uh, it's not as if the European Parliament get to vote for or against or to, you know, an up or down vote like Bernanke, who at one stage was worrying about his job. Whenever Bernanke's thinking about interest rates, when he's thinking about any of that stuff, he has to worry about the political consequences. Wherever there's power, there should always be some form of democratic control. That's not true in the European Union. It's not true with the European Central Bank. It never has been. I don't know about you, but the biggest expense that I have in my life is my mortgage. If, you ha if you're lucky enough to own a house, the biggest expense you're likely to have on any month is your mortgage. I want to be able, in some way, to get my hands on mm. the person who is controlling that expense. That is not possible in Europe. Oh, interesting. Also in Europe, you've got the um, uh, coming up the British elections. Mm. Um, are there any parallels to what's happening there, to what's happened here over the last few years? There are, actually. I mean, it's quite interesting. What's, what's happening in Britain with the elections is that for the longest time, and for, I'm talking the last two years, 
Gordon Brown and the Labour Party had been written off. And for some good reason, the war in Iraq was incredibly unpopular. Um, they uh, not delivered for their base, for the people who have voted them in time and time again. This, is, this would be their fourth term. So there are good reasons for them uh, to be unpopular. But then, in the run-up to the election, we are now probably about six weeks away from a likely election on May the 6th. People are taking a look at the other side. They're mm. taking a look at the Tories, uh, the Conservatives under David Cameron, and they're saying, well, actually, they're going to cut even deeper. They're even worse. Um, the memories of Thatcher, who you know left in 1991, if I'm not mistaken, are still. <laughs> it was so searing. It's like post-traumatic stress disorder. It continued for a long time afterwards. That um, people are taking a look at the Tories and thinking, no, thank you. And I, uh, I don't know whether this is going to happen here, but there is certainly the conventional wisdom here that the Democrats are sunk for 2010. But. There's no parallel reckoning with what Republicans would actually mm. do. It's only like it's like watching a boxing match, but only from one side. So maybe if we looked at the U the UK model, Democrats wouldn't have to be quite so discouraged. But who knows? Mm. They do have on their right the growth of right wing movements, including the Tea Party movement. You've studied the Tea Party. Is is there a parallel there to the growth of white nationalism in the UK? Well, I mean, th there is, and in Europe in general. I mean, generally in Europe, and the UK is slightly better than the rest of uh, uh, the continent in this respect, fascism has become a mainstream ideology, mm -hmm. between 10 and 15% in most countries. In the upcoming um, Dutch elections, you're going to see a whopping vote for Gert Wilders, who's a vicious, vicious racist and Islamophobe. Um, so between 10 and 15% is the regular fascist vote. And this, these are not people who pretend that they're not fascists or who, who, uh, who dress it up. These are, your, you know, for all the talk of Isla Islamo-fascism, which I've never understood quite what that was, here in Europe is just old school fascism. They hate minorities, they hate Jews, uh, they hate women, they hate gays and so on. And um, in Britain, there's a uh, particular expression, the, the British National Party, which is uh, increasingly doing incredibly well. Finally, you've written pretty searingly about the failure of the Obama administration to grapple with growing racial disparities in this country. Just in the last 30 seconds, what are you thinking about this administration right now? Well, I mean, you know, I'm glad they won. Uh, I wish they'd deliver. Um, I think, in my experience of um, being with Tea Party people and so on, they, they prosper. They, um, they prosper on Obama's inability to actually deliver the goods to his base and the people who supported them. You can find links to Gary Young's articles at our website, grittv.org, and his books. Thanks so much for joining us, Gary.